My name is Dave Gaudet. I'm a cameraman with over 25 years experience. I've been everywhere, filming in some of the most out of the way places in Canada and around the world. I discovered my native roots not that long ago. My background is Mi'kmaq from Flat Bay, Newfoundland, and I now live in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Like a lot of people, my Aboriginal heritage was hidden from me. The truth oppressed. So how do I talk about something that I'm still just learning about myself? Regardless, I'm now going on an adventure across North America. Well, far and wide, north and south. Man, I'm just jumping in my camper and I'm bringing a camera to record all the interesting places I go and all the fascinating people I meet. Where will this journey take me? Man, I can't wait to find out. What is a border? Well, it's a line you gotta cross. Some Aboriginal people call the Canada-US border the medicine line. So that's what I'm gonna call it. The international border between Canada and the US is invisible for native people. We were here long before it was, that's for sure. For my journey, I'll be crisscrossing the border, using it only as a guide for my travels. And that's it, nothing else. So let's start this by going to one of my favorite places, New Orleans, Louisiana. You know, each time I go there, I make a direct beeline to the heart of the city, the French Quarter, with its ever-popular Bourbon Street sights and sounds. But not this time. I'm going to somewhere completely different. I'm going to some places I've never been to before. And I'm gonna learn about something that I just heard of, the Mardi Gras Indian. As I understand it, the Mardi Gras Indians have African roots and celebrate their heritage by dressing up in feathers and beads. It's really kind of like a dancer at a powwow. Instead of gathering at powwows, they parade at festivals. And it just so happens one is taking place while I'm here. The New Orleans Jazz Fest. But first, I'm heading over to the Lower Ninth Ward. And right here is the House of Dance and Feathers. It's the passion and dream of Ron Lewis. He built this. It's where art meets history, and we're gonna go inside. Ron! Come in. Dave, get out from Canada. Uh, welcome to the House of Dance and Feathers in the Lower Ninth Ward of the city of New Orleans. There's many things and many stories in here. Tell me about the beadwork. Well, the beadwork is creativity. Whether you're an artist with a paintbrush, or as I call it in New Orleans by the grand, a Picasso with a trade needle. Wow, I love it. That's awesome. If you go to coastal Africa, the Maasai's and all these various coastal tribes wore decorative beadwork. Here in America, the Native Americans wore decorative beadwork on their body. They decorated blankets and stuff for their horses. That's where the similarity of indigenous people connected. The Native American traded in the city of New Orleans, and that's where the blacks decided to take on the image of the Native American and this Mardi Gras culture. This is the map of the trade route that the Native American used to come into the city of New Orleans to trade. To know more about how the cultures intermixed, I went to see Big Chief Tyrone Casby of the Mohawk Hunter Tribe. Basically, the culture in itself extends back to the early 17th century there was an intermingling of cultures because they both were uh, oppressed. They both were under the rule of someone else. They both had their own way of getting away. They both did not want to intermingle, but were forced into it. They befriended the Native Americans. Native Americans offered them homage. And then I met another chief, Chief Shaka Zulu. He owns a restaurant and knows a lot about the culture as well. The ritual is you're taking a year-long process to bead these suits. We put about half a million beads a lot of time on the suit, between five and 10 grand in materials to make these suits. You take that mask and you procession it in the streets in the black neighborhoods. We also have African language, we have native language. We mix all of those languages up. 
can say one thing like two-way pocket way, you know, it means uh, you're full of it, or it also means uh, you go your way, I go mine. Uh, two-way pocket way early in the morning, two-way pocket with my boy, two-way pocket what they talking about, two-way pocket early in the morning. That's usually how it goes. They have their own language. Wow. That means that the Mardi Gras Indian language may be derived from a local native group like the Choctaw. You know, to learn more, I had to go back to school. I think anytime people say we have this separate language, it's because they're expressing a separate identity. Cool. And in some places, people take it and they make it something new and they make it their own thing. And I think that's what's happened here is that people have taken all these different things and they've made it their own. And it's really, it's not Choctaw anymore. And it's not French, it is Mardi Gras Indian, whatever that means, but that is what it is now. And it belongs to this group of people and it's, it's something that they change over time and that they identify with. The Mardi Gras Indian is really its own unique culture. I kind of see how it came together, but I wanted to see it personally and in action. So the Mardi Gras Indians are parading at Jazz Fest today, but Jazz Fest say there's no way they're gonna let this camera in. It's too high caliber. So we're gonna have to set this one down and leave it aside. So, digital SLR. This one here, half decent. Better than that, really. It's gonna do great. So I drove across town to the Jazz Fest. I knew I'd probably hear the Mardi Gras Indian songs before I saw them, but I had no idea what I was gonna encounter next. I was invited by Big Chief Casby to film his Mardi Gras Indian tribe in action at the New Orleans Jazz Festival. With my camera ready, I headed towards the music. The first person I see is the Mohawk tribe's moss man. He comes before the big chief's arrival, so I know Casby is nearby. Because of the big costumes and concealed faces, it's hard to know which one's Casby. This could be him. Oh man, I'm not really sure. I finally found Casby. Music is universal, and certain drum beats, when I get to hear a drum beat, I'm ready to jump. Whoa! At last, I was hearing the Mardi Gras Indian language in action. Most of your signals are secretive, and most of your language is secretive. And it's all mixed with natives and African language. I could see how the language they created was like a special tool. It was like a secret code to hide things from the people who always tried to oppress them. The deep spirituality of this is not just a mask, it's not just a facade, it's, uh, it's real, you know, and that's what we do, and that's what we're trying to continue to get the younger guys to understand that when you make that costume, it's not just a big uh, show. There's something deeper than the show, or deeper than the facade. I mean, people starting to understand who we are, what we do, and why we do it. all the party people gathering to shake off my worries and blow off steam. It's kind of what the city was known for. You know, it's jovial atmosphere and shiny beads and cool beverages. But learning more of the connection this city has to native culture completely changes the way I now see it.
The Mardi Gras Indian remains a powerful symbol of people creating something really good out of something really bad. Celebrating the human spirit with song, dance, and bright colors, all in the face of the darkness of humanity. It's a new day and another road. I'm heading north across the border into Canada to another dark place, traveling to a location far away from New Orleans. La Jack, British Columbia is just 150 kilometers west of Prince George and was home to one of the most notorious residential schools in Canada. Man, I feel like I shouldn't be here at all, but some mysterious force is pulling me forward. The LeJac Residential School closed in the 1990s and was torn down. This place now is one of miracles, or so they say. And some even claim to be healed by an otherworldly power. At the center of it all is this woman, Rose Prince, who died at a young age. Now even the dirt at her grave site they say is considered sacred. People here say Rose devoted her life to helping others. She was compassionate to everyone around her. One local man summed up who Rose was in his carrier language. Rose Prince, but see the Behunzu. I mean, she had a very good heart. But see, is your heart the Behunzu? I mean, she's the be means really big. Hunzu means great, good. There's all sorts of mysterious circumstances surrounding her death. And now, people pray to her to be healed. I have to admit, I'm a skeptic. This all seems just a little bit too unreal to be true. I'm in Lijak, British Columbia. A strange place of miracles associated with a woman named Rose Prince. Somehow people claim the dirt from around her gravesite has special healing powers. I just had to meet someone affected by Rose. Now, where are you from, Nick? I used to work at the mine here. What did you do at the mine? Oh, well, I was the blaster at the mine, huh? For years. Come on. Yeah. yeah. Cool, man. And that's how I broke my back. My pain was so bad, I wanted to die. Brought dirt off of Rose's grave, put the mud on my back. Doesn't hurt nothing. Like, no pain at all, nowhere. And I don't know, a week or two later, I just went back to work. You know, things seem more far-fetched than ever. But yet, I continue to meet more people who claim to be healed by the dirt. Came to the grave, prayed for my foot, then we got some dirt and to take home. Took out the bandage and my foot was normal. So I believe that I got healed while I was at the gravesite. If the idea of these miracles happening with the dirt wasn't strange enough, the story of Rose's death and what happened to her after is even crazier. Amazingly, the nurse who attended to Rose on her deathbed in 1949 was at the pilgrimage. She heard I was there and wanted to talk to me. She was very serene. And it wasn't a fatalistic kind of acceptance. It was a, a quiet joy that she was going to, you know, to see God. Scientifically, if I can go that way, yeah. what you saw after she died, yeah. can you explain it now? I can't explain it except to say that it was the miracle of a body that does not undergo decomposition. There was something strange about the whole situation, but Rose was gone, and she was buried right here on the residential school grounds. Two years later, the entire gravesite had to be moved, and for some reason, her coffin opened in transit. Jack LeCert was just a kid when it all happened, and he saw it all. It just seemed like she was entombed in a total vacuum, because even as a young fellow then, I was right there and I could hear it, you know, and so, it's, so, so could they, and it's a 
Krishna, you know, so it was, wow, okay. So at that thing, it sort of got your attention, you know, like this one is totally and completely different. It doesn't seem like she, even she was asleep. You know, it really didn't seem like she was asleep, like she was, she was awake, you know, but she, her eyes were closed, you know. And it's called incorruptibility, which to Catholics is a sign that Rose one day could be a candidate for sainthood. I found out there were two more people I had to meet at the pilgrimage. These people had experienced the Rose Prince miracle firsthand. The miracle took place at a terrible accident at an outdoor gathering. So 10 or 11 years ago, what happened? I was running around looking for my grandpa, and I tripped and I fell in the fire. And I got really like badly burnt. Her whole arm and her whole arm on that side and part of her face and her hair was singed. Her back was the worst, because when she fell in the fire, that was the first part that burned me. So I just put rose prince dirt on her where it wasn't burned, just prayed to her, and I just, I said, I'm gonna leave my granddaughter to you so that she doesn't scar and that she doesn't have to go through the surgeries the doctors are predicting they're gonna have to be doing for the next few years. One morning I got up and it just seemed like every blister in that body of hers was taken away, and so was the scars on her body. Three weeks after that, we were allowed to ship her back to Prince George. And from there, she just got better. See right here? That's the only little tiny scar. I think that's just a reminder for us to remember Rose Prince that we still have to pray to her. I felt overwhelmed by Miss Gina's grandmother's story. I needed some time to think and just absorb it all. I grabbed my camera. This place where oppression reigned over innocent people, a place with one of the most notorious residential schools in Canada, actually feels serene. Not oppressive at all, but kind of beautiful. Maybe that's the miracle. But really, the thing that strikes me the most looking around this place is that it reminds me of Flat Bay, Newfoundland, the place where my native roots are. I'm going to tell my family in my chill coordination about what happened to my granddaughter. I would say, Gun Cha, Agu Cha. Gun Cha, Agu Cha? Yep. Gun Cha, Agu Cha. Gun Cha, Agu Cha. Gun Cha, Agu Cha. That's how I would say something very big has happened. On my way back to the pilgrimage, I meet a nice man named George George. He wants to sing a song for me in his carrier language. Depression pushes some people down, but surprisingly, it does the opposite to others. It inspires them to express themselves, to make their culture and beliefs prominent in the world, to declare themselves in a way they may not have before. I've met people. 
people here who said, you know, I hated this place. I, did, I, I didn't, never wanted to come here, but I, I made this move to come. And said, so, you know, this is good for me. Yeah, no big miracle, but I feel good that I came on this land again. Maybe they walk out of here and there's no big miracle has happened to them, but the experience here has been powerful. Can miracles happen? I'm convinced something is happening to all these folks, and Rose Prince is definitely at the center of it all. To me, I think, to this day, if you and I and all of us were to exhume that body, you would see, I'm sure, the same thing that I saw then. To be sure, this is what you would see. Maybe the real miracle here is the resilience of the human spirit, the way our culture, history, and languages help us rise above. It happened on both sides of the medicine line with the Mardi Gras Indians and Rose Prince. And so I'm hitting the road again, and I'm much more inspired than when I arrived. And you know what? That's kind of cool.